right, so our first speaker, we're gonna, looks like we'll start right on time, It's Peter Risen. I would have said Risen, all these names I've read and never actually heard spoken, but uh, he's a phys physicist and chief scientist of Bitcoin Unlimited. Thanks, Peter. All right, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you all so much for coming. I'm going to start this talk with an anecdote. I had a really interesting conversation with one of the founders of Zcash at the Consensus Conference in New York last month. He said that cryptocurrency is more theology than science. In science, we start with the null hypothesis and an attitude of skepticism, and then make observations on the reality around us. In theology, we start with scriptures that we believe to be divine, and then twist and contort our observations to make it appear that those scriptures remain unchallenged. I sort of laughed to myself as I thought about the contorted logic our friends at Blockstream Core used to justify some of their scriptures. For example, thou shalt download code from only the Bitcoin Core repo, for only it is divine. <laughs> or, thou shalt mine no block larger than the holy number of one megabyte. <clears throat> but then I began to ask myself whether, whether there were certain scriptures or rules about Bitcoin that I thought were unchallengeable. And I came up with two. The first is that Bitcoin can move from place to place but cannot be created willy-nilly out of thin air. And number two, in order for a Bitcoin to move, the transfer must be authorized by the owner's digital signature. So I viewed number one as Bitcoin's physical property rule. It's what makes this abstract sequence of bits flying around the internet behave like physical property with scarcity. Number two, I saw as Bitcoin's private property rule. It's what enforces ownership rights on that new digital property that rule number one creates. So until I had that discussion in New York, I kind of took it for granted that everybody would view this rules the same way as I did. But now I actually think these two rules are just manifestations of my own inner ideology. For one, I'm a physicist by training, so I think rule number one here comforts me because it means I can think about this abstract concept of Bitcoin using uh, physical matter that I already understand really well. And rule number two, well, uh, politically I lean towards the libertarian philosophy and I believe in strong private property rights. But number two is just in a way encoding my belief about private property into the protocol. So where I'm going is that I think all rules could ultimately be seen as fanatical, like for the same reasons that I think a small blocker promoting his one megabyte forever dogma is acting fanatically. I could see somebody in the future thinking that I'm acting fanatically by trying to uh, uh, enforce rule number two here. Like let's imagine in the future, we know for certain that some nasty terrorist has 100,000 Bitcoins in this address and we can't get his private keys. And everyone's saying, well, let's just, let's just move it without the signature, who cares? That's a politically expedient thing to do. I would be screaming bloody murder because I think that would threaten the very foundations of Bitcoin. But I could see that some people who thinks that's the politically expedient thing to do would, be, would, would, would see my uh, hesitation to that as acting fanatically in the same way that I think the small blockers are acting fanatically. So where I'm going with this is, I think this debate we've been having in the cryptocurrency space for the last two or three years is never going to be settled by science alone because we're not arguing about scientific facts. What we're arguing is about the ideology that should actually be encoded into this cryptocurrency systems themselves. And ideology is by definition normative. Okay. So going through this exercise uh, made it clear to me why I had this intuitive dislike for the SegWit protocol. And the reason is, with Bitcoin, both of these two rules that I hold dear are intertwined intimately into the very definition, the very structure of a Bitcoin. Whereas with SegWit, the private property rule is subordinate to the physical property rule, which I believe gives SegWit coins weaker private property guarantees. All right, the title of my talk is A SegWit Coin is Not a Bitcoin. 
and I make and defend five claims. Claim number one is that SegWit coins have a different definition than Bitcoins, which gives them different properties. Claim number two is that unlike with Bitcoins, miners can update their UTXO sets without witnessing the previous owner's digital signatures. Claim number three, the previous owner's digital signatures have significantly less value to a miner for SegWit coins than for Bitcoins because miners do not require them in order to claim fees. Four, although a stable Nash equilibrium exists where all miners witness the previous owner's digital signatures for Bitcoins, one does not exist for SegWit coins. And lastly, five, SegWit coins thus have a weaker security model than Bitcoins. Okay, I make some simplifying assumptions. I assume that miners are rational, short-term profit maximizing agents, but I also assume that no miner will knowingly be complicit in fraud. All right, so on to claim number one. In order to show that SegWit coins have a definition, different definition than Bitcoins, a good place to start is, well, what's the definition of a Bitcoin? <clears throat> and a good place to look for the answer to that question is in the original Bitcoin white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto. If we turn to page two, we find the answer we're looking for. Satoshi writes, we define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. So what is a Bitcoin? A Bitcoin is a chain of digital signatures. Each owner transfers a coin to the next by digitally signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner and adding these to the end of the coin. A payee can verify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. And he included this diagram to help make sense of the paragraph above. So we take a closer look at this diagram on this slide, which is a complicated one because there's a lot of things going on. So it's easier to understand if we just build this diagram up piece by piece. So let's imagine this first transaction here and let's add some names to, uh, to the picture. So we have this transaction and this is the end of, end of our coin right now with Alice's pub key and Zoe's signature. So if that transaction is mined to the blockchain, who owns the coin right now? Is it Alice or is it Zoe? Alice, good, right. So let's imagine Alice wants to transfer this coin to Bob. What does she do? Well, first she needs Bob's public key, and then she's going to hash that transaction that Zoe gave her, combine it with Bob's public key, pull out her private key, sign the resulting hash, package it up in a transaction, and either deliver that to Alice or broadcast it to the Bitcoin network to be mined in the block. The coin now belongs to Bob. If Bob wants to pass it on to Carol, he just repeats the same process. And we've built up figure number one from the Satoshi white paper. All right, so how does this picture change if we're considering SegWit coins instead? Well, in a Bitcoin, the signatures are an integral part of the chain. Carol can only verify the complete chain of ownership if all the signatures exist because if even a single signature is missing, the chain breaks down and there's no way to follow it through. A SegWit coin is different because the signatures are all outside of the chain. If even none of the signatures exist, or maybe none of the signatures were even real to begin with, Carol can still uh, validate the chain of custody. I'm, I'm using the word custody instead of the chain of ownership because SegWit really only shows custody. So the bottom line is that a Bitcoin is a chain of digital signatures, whereas a SegWit coin is something else. <clears throat> All right, so we know that SegWit transactions are non-malleable, but what other properties do they have that are different than Bitcoins? <clears throat> well, with SegWit coins, miners can update their UTXO sets without witnessing the previous owner's digital signatures. So a little bit of background on that. Uh, I think a lot of you guys know that each node maintains a ledger of which coins belong to which entities. That's called the UTXO set or the unspent transaction output set. And at a high level of abstraction, we can imagine it as a spreadsheet. The first column is the hash of all the Bitcoins that remain unspent. And the next column is who owns those Bitcoins. All right, so when a miner or a node receives a new block, 
The miner is going to parse through all the different transactions in the block. He's going to remove the uh, spent outputs and replace them with the new unspent outputs. So it's important to, uh, to see what that process looks like. Uh, uh, and to do that, we'll examine our transfer from Alice to Bob. So the miner doesn't see all this information. All he sees is Alice's actual transaction to Bob, which looks like something like this. So the first thing the miner is going to do is he's going to say, OK, well, what coin is this transaction trying to spend? Well, it's trying to spend A46E. So it's going to go up to its UTXO set. It's going to say, OK, that coin exists. It's unspent, and it belongs to Alice. Did Alice sign this transaction? Yes, she did. Looks good. So I'm going to call this transaction spent, and I'm going to transfer ownership of that coin to Bob. To do that, the miner hashes that transaction. He gets B56A. He writes that up there in his UTXO set with Bob as the new owner. Okay. So the critical observation here is that even if the miner didn't check Alice's signature, he still had to witness Alice's signature in order to update his UTXO set. If we imagine Alice transferring his coin to Bob using a SegWit transaction, the situation is different. Now the miner can still update his ledger of who owns what coins, even if Alice's signature isn't in his possession, and even if Alice's signature doesn't even exist at all. All right, number three, the previous owner's digital signatures have significantly less value to a miner for SegWit coins than for Bitcoins because miners do not require them in order to claim fees. Okay, so on this slide, we're going to look at the, uh, the profit a miner earns when he finds a Bitcoin block. So he earns a 12.5 BTC reward, plus any fees included in this block, but we have to subtract from that revenue his cost of, of finding the proof of work. So we get that equation. If the miner doesn't have even a single signature from that block, all he can do is mine an empty block, so he can't claim any fees. So we have this equation instead. We have to uh, adjust this slightly because there is still a slight chance that the previous block was invalid. So I have to discount that revenue by 1 minus p, where p is a probability that the previous block was invalid. Okay, so a reasonable measure for the value of the Bitcoin signatures is the difference between the miner's profit with the signatures and the miner's profit without the signatures. Subtracting those two equations gives this expression. If we go through that same set of logic using SegWit coins, the result is slightly different because with or without the signatures, uh, the miners can still claim fees in the SegWit case. So the equation looks like that instead. Now, the critical observation on this slide is just how small of a number P is. To date, almost 500,000 Bitcoin blocks have been mined, and maybe five or so have been invalid. So empirically, P is a number like one part in 100,000, or 0 0.00001. Tiny. And that makes sense because nobody wants to mine a block unless they're sure it's valid, because they're going to not get any money for it, but it costs them a bunch of money to do so. So basically, P is zero for all intents and purposes. If we take the limit of those two equations, we see that for Bitcoins, the signatures still retain value, whereas for SegWit coins, the, the signatures no longer have value. And I want to highlight this fact because that difference could change the incentives for mining SegWit coins with, uh, in comparison to mining Bitcoins. All right, so on to claim number four. Although a stable Nash equilibrium exists where all miners witness the previous owner's digital signatures for Bitcoin, one does not exist for SegWit coins. So the next slide is to witness or not to witness. A Nash equilibrium is stable if a small change for one player leads to a situation where two conditions hold. Number one, the players who did not change have no better strategy in the new circumstances. And also, the player who did change is now playing with a strictly worse strategy. So I'm claiming that a Nash equilibrium exists for Bitcoins where all of the miners are witnessing the signatures because then their revenue is the reward plus the fees. So let's imagine that some miners deviate from that strategy 
and adopt the not witnessing strategy. Because they can no longer claim fees, they now uh, make less revenue, so they're playing with a strictly worse strategy. So condition number two is satisfied, and they're going to return back to the Nash equilibrium. In reality, the picture is slightly more complex because <coughs> let's imagine that it's on an infinitesimal amount of hash power that changes, maybe 20% of the hash power decides to change the not witnessing strategy, but because they can only mine empty blocks, that means there's actually more fee revenue available for the uh, miners uh, maintaining the witnessing strategy. So the witnessing strategy becomes even more profitable. And again, you see we have the uh, conditions for a stable equilibrium. <clears throat> the situation for SegWit is different. If we imagine we start out in a state like this, where all of the miners are witnessing and enforcing the SegWit rule set, and then we have, let's say, 20% of the miners deviate to the not witnessing state. Well, it moves here, but the SegWit miners, they're no longer witnessing, or the miners are no longer witnessing, they start er er earning, the, like this, this, their strategy is still as profitable as the witnessing strategy. So this is still an equilibrium, maybe 40%. Uh, start not witnessing. And still, this is still an equilibrium. So there's no stable equilibrium all along this line. They're all basically equally profitable for, for the miners. What's interesting though, is if we stretch out that axis to show 100% something, something different happens. If the point moves far enough this way that we cross a 50% boundary, and we're pretty sure that most of the hash power is no longer enforcing the SegWit rules, well, now the people that are still enforcing the segment rules, now they're at a strong disadvantage because now they're going to fork themselves off the network and they'll earn zero. So uh, we see that at this side, we do have a stable equilibrium. And that's this point where nobody is enforcing SegWit, which is, of course, the equilibrium that we're operating in right now. All right. Claim number five. SegWit coins have a weaker security model than Bitcoins. So to, to show this, I wanted to come up with some way that a group of attackers could fraudulently spend SegWit coins using some attack that wouldn't work or would work with less efficacy on the pay to script hash soft fork we had four years ago. And I think there's a whole family of such attacks and they all center around the idea of tempting the miners into not witnessing the SegWit signatures by making it more profitable for them to ignore the SegWit signatures. So specifically, uh, one mechanism that seems to work on paper is to uh, withhold and release the witness extension blocks strategically using a variant of the selfish mining attack. Okay, so how is this gonna work? <laughs> Let's imagine our blockchain looks like this. The green box is our blockchain tip. Everybody's mining on that tip. And our pool of attacking miners, we find the next block. So what we do is we broadcast the block, but we keep our little SegWit extension block private. And we also make sure that SegWit extension block is tiny because we can control how big it is. So maybe there's only one SegWit, seg SegWit transaction in that block. So we're mining here along with all the defectors that we, we've uh, got and all the people that are still enforcing SegWit are mining at a lower block height. Okay, so we've also put uh, listing nodes all over the network. So we're listening to all the different miners, uh, uh, pool stratum servers. And as soon as we think one of the miners on the previous block has found a new block, we uh, release our little extension block uh, before their block even propagates the network, trying to, sorry, trying to win as many of these people over to come to our block instead of mining on this block. And you can kind of see what's happening. If we can get enough of them to come over, well, now this block is more likely to be orphaned than this block. So what we're trying to do is basically train the miners to understand that by not mining on this block, by mining on this block instead, they're actually at a profit disadvantage. So uh, that's only one state of the selfish mining attack. There's a bunch more details that I won't go over. If you're interested in, I uh, suggest reading the selfish mining paper by Emin Gunsir and uh, Ite Yao. I think it's one of the best papers written in the Bitcoin space. Uh, <clears throat> but, but what I will say is that a critical parameter in the selfish mining attack is this uh, gamma parameter. And that's the fraction of the miners here that we can convince to join our block here 
when we quickly release our extension block. <coughs> okay, so if gamma equals one, if we can basically win everybody over, then we have a very strong strategy. <coughs> our revenue is this gray curve here, where the revenue for the SigWit enforcers is that orange curve there. Even if our attacking pool has only a few percent of the half power, we are still more profitable than the SegWit enforcers. So the SegWit enforcers being rational short-term profit maximizing agents, they'll seem to by defecting, they can earn more money. So more of them are gonna defect. That pushes us further along the, uh, the hash power defecting. Our strategy becomes even more uh, profitable. This strategy becomes even less profitable. And of course, that's a recipe for an unstable equilibrium and a collapse of SegWit. <clears throat> if gamma is 0.5, well, our strategy is actually a losing strategy if our pool's uh, uh, small enough, but as soon as we have enough attackers, it becomes profitable again. And if gamma is one, then it takes about a third of the miners to do this attack. I think in reality, we can make gamma quite big, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, so I don't think this case is realistic. I think this case or this case is much more realistic. Okay. So where are we going with this? So, so what we're trying to do is basically train the miners to no longer bother enforcing uh, the, the, the SegWit, to mine on blocks before they've received the witness data. So once we're confident that the majority of the network is no longer enforcing SegWit, then we're gonna start rerouting SegWit transactions to our own personal addresses. But this time, we're never gonna actually release the witness data. Blocks are gonna get built above our fraudulent transfer, confirming it. <coughs> And what's so insidious about this attack is no one is ever going to have proof that a fraud occurred. For example, with SegWit, it's fine to prune the witness data. In fact, it's encouraged to prune the witness data. So we get a state, let's say 20 blocks later, someone claims that there's been a theft, the witness data is missing, but nobody can actually prove that that theft occurred. Okay, so this wouldn't work for pay to script hash because pay to script hash has the definitions of a Bitcoin. Uh, so we can imagine a variant of this attack and instead of withholding the SegWit extension block, let's just hold a signature from one of the pay to script hash transactions. And then we'll, let's try to imagine using that same strategy. It's not gonna work because there's no way for the other miners to be sure that the transactions that make up the block actually correspond to the Merkle root in the block header. So, uh, uh, any third party could have proposed a different sequence of transactions and the miners would have no way to know. So there's no way for them to update their UTXO sets. So everybody has to mine empty blocks in this attack, whereas in the SegWit attack, they can still confirm economically relevant blocks and it changes the scenario entirely. All right, so if I haven't yet convinced you that there's a difference, a fundamental difference between a SegWit coin and a Bitcoin, I leave you with this thought experiment. Imagine that you have 100 BTC in a SegWit address, and a few days later you notice that they've been transferred to an address that you do not control. Okay, so you try to find the signature that authorized the transfer to prove the theft, because you're sure that your private keys were secure, so you think the signature must be bogus. But when you go to do so, conveniently nobody seems to have it saved. Can you prove that a theft has actually occurred. All right, so that's it for me. Thank you all for listening. Wow, that's uh, powerful stuff. Um, so I'm just curious what you think would happen if SegWit were to go through and this attack happened, what would the eventual outcome be? Well, I mean, one of the reasons I started doing this research was because I I was worried that SegWit might be like this cancer that would slowly spread and destroy Bitcoin. But although I don't speak highly of SegWit, I actually don't think it's that bad because I think SegWit is distinct enough from Bitcoin that if SegWit is insecure, it won't kill Bitcoin at the same time. They can, they can, they can coexist peacefully in a way. So now rather than viewing SegWit as cancer, I view it as an ugly wart. <laughs> I'd rather not have it, but it's, not gonna kill me, I can still live my life, and if I get annoyed enough with that wart, I can use a little bit of li li liquid nitrogen and remove it. So perhaps if SegWit happens and this happens, 
better for you in the long run. There's some vindication. And... Yeah, yeah, I think that would that would be that would be, that would be a, a good outcome if Segwit activates with all this controversy that happens, and then it turns out that Segwit gets reverted. I think that would be a, a real win for Bitcoin. Okay, you want me to throw it? Is that more fun? Okay. Thanks. Um, one question. Uh, why do you think uh, blocks without witness data are economically relevant? Why would they have any, uh, still have economic value if you don't have the witness data? Uh, oh, I'm assuming I'll show you here. So this, okay, imagine when SegWit happens, like the, most of the transactions are still gonna be normal Bitcoin transactions. There'll be very little economic activity on SegWit at first. And we have lots of precedent for that. If you look at like the pay to script hash rollout, for years, there was only like 0.2% of the transactions were actually paid to script test transactions. So there's going to be very little economic activity happening here. So most of the things that people care about is that Bitcoin block. So ignoring this, this, the SegWit extension block really, really matters very little. Did that answer your question? Mm, not really, because you're, you're, you're seeing it as a closed system, right? But there's lots of things happening uh, uh, in the... In the entire Bitcoin world, everyone is, if everyone commits to validating, uh, only accepting blocks which are validated with witness data, mm -hmm. then those are, th that's important for this system, right? You're looking at the, at one part, like a closed system and not at the entire uh, So are you economy. saying that like non-mining nodes are going to enfor be the ones enforcing SigWit? Uh, yes. Also, yeah. There's. Because the, I'm the definitely, biggest, I'm definitely looking at half power here. I'm not yeah. really, I'm not really. Uh, I'm assuming that the non-mining nodes don't really have too much influence over the protocol. So, am yeah. I understanding your, your question right? I think they have uh, relevance. Yeah, because if 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 like an exchange only accepts uh, Segwit coins, things will stop. You understand? Uh, things will happen in the world, and uh, and 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 it will have consequences. Well, I think. I mean, I think that's one of the big untested or unanswered questions in Bitcoin. Like if we imagine that, uh, let's not use SegWit, because SegWit is de uh, definitely controversial. Let's imagine some, uh, actually, no, 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 it's, it's okay. Let, let's, let's use SegWit. Let's, let's imagine that everybody agrees with SegWit. The exchanges, like you said, they're not going to accept uh, this chain that doesn't enforce SegWit. But suddenly, the miners start producing my chain, which is missing a little bit of witness data, right? And no blocks get confirmed on the other chain. Like at what point do does the does do the exchangers just say, well something went wrong? Like let's just move over here. Yeah, we're missing this one signature, but it doesn't really matter. We we have to move over there because that's where all the economic activity is happening. That's the only chain that mine blocks are being mined on. Work our way back. Start there. I have another question, so I have to do the response then. But uh, the the exchanges need to have for the for the miner to to uh, to exchange their coins. Mm -hmm. They they have to go to the uh, they have to go to an exchange. Mm -hmm. So the exchange has to has to have all the all the witness data to be able to to for the for the miner to to. to uh, well, no, but you're you're assuming that everybody wants SegWit, right? There's a lot of people that don't want SegWit. There's a lot of, like, Anthony uh, Zegers gave a talk about, like, a market for fork features. And I think that's a really accurate way to look at it. So you could imagine a future where the market is actually valuing the, the chain where SegWit isn't supported higher than the chain that it is supported on. So this idea that somehow everybody's going to dogmatically want SegWit is, is not true. Like, the question, the question is kind of unanswered. Like, how many people really want SegWit? I think very few do. So I think the market value for the chain where SegWit is destroyed would be higher. So the, I think the exchanges would love to take it. They just need some excuse. And I think this gives them a perfect excuse. Yes. Thank you very much for that great lead into the thing that I was going to say. But because I, I believe that SegWit is a very real systemic risk. Um, and bear with me, this explanation will take maybe two minutes, so I'm, gonna, yes, I'm, I'm going to try to keep it as short, as simple as possible. When you, the way that SegWit is implemented is that you are subverting one a rule of the old system and using it in a new, new way, namely that anyone can spend. Mm -hmm. That means that you are, I, I've used the term that you are embedding a virtual branch within the main branch. You could also use the phrase that you are embedding a ver, uh, an alternative reality 
within the main branch. This mm -hmm. alternative reality can erupt at any time into the real world. Yeah. And at, at the, worst the worst that could happen is that this could be a system systemic risk. And I'm not saying that this eruption into the real world of this alter alternative reality will happen by 51% minus subverting the system. It could happen in a thousand ways. Mm -hmm. It could, for, because on the inside of this system where you now have 20% of all coins are sitting on SegWit addresses and, and people on the inside, like me, want to punish the ones that are destroying value within the system, I for sure as hell will support any way that those coins will be stolen. And I will do it gladly. And that means that this risk will continue to exist within the system when you are subverting the old rules. Yeah, I, 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 oh, go on, go on. Uh, I'm just going to say that you could, you, could, well, you could put it another way. What you are doing is that you are embedding a futures market within the main branch. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are offering you a bet to bet against them are everyone that are holding coins on SegWit addresses. Mm -hmm. Could I have a response from your side on, on, on this reasoning? Well, I, I completely agree with you, and I, I, I think that's one, one of the things I was trying to communicate. Uh, uh, I, just, I, I just, just want to add, add one more thing there uh, with regards to it. Let's assume that this alternative reality manifests in, in a split of the chain. There are three outcomes to, to that chain, to, to that, to that uh, scenario, if, both, if uh, the branches survive for a prolonged period of time. The first is that the ones on the main chain that the alternative reality erupts from, they lose all the, the, seg, the SegWit value on the, on the erupting uh, uh, branch. The second worst scenario is that they will the, the main chain will die due, due to the eruption, meaning that all SegWit holders will lo lose all their coins. The, the most uh, severe scenario is complete systemic failure due to lost faith in the system. I'm, see, that was my original concern. I thought that like a failure of SegWit could take down Bitcoin as a whole, but I'm less worried about that now, just because I think if SegWit were reverted and SegWit holders lost their coins, I think people would see the structure of a SegWit coin is sufficiently different from a Bitcoin that just the failure of SegWit doesn't necessarily mean the failure of Bitcoin. Yeah. So, so, so that's why I actually am less worried about SegWit now that I've done this yeah. work. And, and I'm actually less worried about it as well, because... Uh, this, this alternative reality doesn't even have to manifest, manifest because the extra risk with those SegWit coins will always show in the price of SegWitters, so they will be worth less, always. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Like, who, who is going to, be, if you agree that SegWit coins have a higher risk of being stolen than regular Bitcoins, and you can trade SegWit coins for Bitcoins at par value, who's going to really hold their coins as SegWit coins? They're going to transfer them back to Bitcoins. Uh, All right, so uh, oh, I guess you, you probably had a, a number of assumptions that you made. Uh, the real question I have is, is your claim that this uh, can play out, this particular attack uh, being profitable, as SegWit is currently implemented? Or are you making other assumptions? Well, it depends what you mean by currently implemented. You mean like... Like, are you assuming everybody's running the Bitcoin core version of SegWit, or are we allowing miners to tweak the protocol uh, as, as they please to do things that they think are towards their benefit? Uh, well, I would say, let's say, you know, SegWit gets activated either you know, via SegWit2x or BIP148, whatever. Uh, that, that particular code that was originally merged into core and maybe in other clients currently, and that is what is being used by the nodes that are enforcing it, then of course there could be other nodes that are not enforcing it. Right. So as long as you allow for the nodes that are currently enforcing it to decide to change their protocol in some ways and maybe not enforce it or maybe change the way they're accepting like the witness data and things like that, then yes, I think this attack can play out today. Okay. But I think it can, like realistically, I, I showed that the attack could play out even if the attacking pools only had, you know, one or two percent of the hash power, but that required that gamma parameter to be one. But really, gamma is not going to be one. It's going to be less than that. So I think the attack can realistically only play out if there's sufficient contention in the ecosystem that a lot of people actually want to attack SegWit. If everybody wakes up tomorrow and says, oh, we all love SegWit, everybody's happy, no, I think SegWit will be secure. 
Okay, so I, I guess that would probably be a response to what I was really getting at here is uh, if this is a feasible attack that can be profitable for certain people, then should we expect it to happen on Litecoin? Should we expect it to happen on any other coins that have implemented the exact type of SegWit that is being proposed to be implemented on Bitcoin? Uh, I, oh, sorry. You know, we got a lot of people who raise hands and we're, we're almost uh, out of time. Okay, hand it to you. Any, anyone else with a question? <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes. So, so just one quick comment on this. I mean, we all remember how Bitcoin Core basically said, "Well, we're only only going to do soft forks because soft forks are safer." The interesting thing is this attack is only possible because it's a soft fork. Because yeah. basically, with a hard fork, you have a clear distinction on which branch you are, and every node knows which chain it follows. And now we have basically like it's actually more dangerous, in my opinion, that to do the um, soft fork for a contentious change. I mean, we have these two things being talked about, like contentious changes and soft fork versus hard forks, and there's a problem actually with soft forks and contention. If there's no contention, I don't see a problem with the soft fork, yeah. but it, the problem exists. Yeah. Soft fork and a contention, right? Because you're in this gray area, like that, the, that sliding Nash equilibrium where the, they were all stable, because you never really know how much of the network is actually enforcing the soft fork rules. Right. Yeah. Okay, because the next speaker has to set up his laptop. I'm going to do a couple more. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. I just have a question regarding the gamma parameter. Um, uh, can we assume that with, uh, with time and there being more stack with transactions, we create a honeypot for that gamma to increase? Mm -hmm. So even that if tomorrow everything looks great and everybody is enforcing SegWit, we are creating an incentive in the future to not enforce it anymore. Right, I, I, I agree. So gamma is not necessarily static. It, it can increase as people start to think, well, SegWit's not actually good. The chain would have higher value if SegWit were removed, and us miners get to share this honeypot as well. Then, yeah, I, I think everybody can slowly kind of start migrating to this state where they're no longer enforcing SegWit, and then suddenly we have this systemic collapse of, of, of the SegWit coins. Um, no, I, I fully, excellent talk. I fully agree. I just wanted to point out that um, I believe it's not inherent to fixing malleability, nor to be it being a soft fork, because uh, the BIP 140 malleability fix that still commits the witness data to the Merkle tree does not suffer from it. So it, it, it's an unnecessary flaw that we shouldn't make, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Thank you very Great, much, Peter. You. Great presentation.